It's so good to be back together this morning, to be in the place of praise and worship. Liz and Carla and Wendy and Russ, thank you so much for leading us so well this morning. Um, it's good to be in that place, isn't it, where we're all lifting our voices together. It's like there's, <clears throat> I was looking at what I'm going to speak on this morning and some of the things I'm going to say, and I was like, oh, it just feels like we've got such a sense of togetherness this morning. Like we've been apart for so long, uh, you know, it feels like we've been apart for so long over the summer, and it was great to be with so many people at, at the festival, but there's a coming together today, it feels like the church is unified, united again, and that's a beautiful thing to see. I was just standing in front here just saying, thank you, Lord, for a church such as this, where God's people are together in harmony, in their singing and in their praises, and in their approach to the Lord Jesus. This morning, um, we're going to have a little bit of an update on the term ahead, um, and then I'm going to dive into the word. Um, We're going to be looking at Galatians 5 uh, this morning. Um, and, uh, but I thought it was important, as it's the first week we're meeting together at the end of the summer holidays, um, that we have a look at what's coming up this term. Um, this is a new season, uh, new opportunities. You know, God gives us the seasons, doesn't he, to help us navigate the year and work out where, we, where we're sitting in the year. Um, and in the same way, as we come to the end of the school holidays, for us as a church, we tend to work on a sort of school holiday cycle. And we get here in the first weekend of September looking ahead to the new season that God's giving us. Now, as we look ahead, it's important to look at where we've been. Um, Commission Festival was amazing. It was so good to be together as a church family in one place, eating together, um, having fellowship together, annoying one another. Um, that all happens as well. But it's such a blessing to be, have gathered together. Um, it was a real highlight of my year. And I always stress about these sorts of things because it's sort of like there's so many people and I I like my own space, but it was such a blessing this year. It was a real highlight of the year. If you didn't make it, um, you missed out. Is the reality of it. Sorry, but you did. I was there and I feel like there was stuff that I missed out on. Um, That's the nature of having young children. Um, But the tickets go on sale tomorrow. Please, 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 if you can, book in, get along. Um, and if finance is something that's blocking you from being able to go, then come and talk to me or one of the other elders, Neil or Russ, and we'd love to see what we can do to help. But really, I encourage each of us to make it a priority next year. Um, it will be better than it was this year, um, which was already a good thing. So let's get booked in. Um, okay, so that's sort of looking back at what's happened and now looking forward. We're changing some things this term. Um, so listen up, because it will affect you. Um, we're moving going deeper. So Going Deeper has been a, 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 an evening meeting that we've been running once a month, looking at deeper aspects of th- going deeper on theology or thinking about how are we reaching out, what can we do better, looking at spiritual gifts, um, looking at uh, healing and so on, um, and praying for those things as well in these meetings. Um, but the, we've had a real challenge getting people along on a, on a Sunday night. So what we're going to do is we're going to move Going Deeper to a weekday, so that more of us can prioritize getting there, and then we can all come as our life groups. Um, Life groups are core to the life of the church. Um, So if you're not in a life group, get in touch. Get in touch with Nina. She'd love to chat to you about uh, getting into a life group. Um, But we want to make going deeper more accessible, so we're going to make it accessible to the life groups to be able to come en masse. Um, Everyone who's been to going deeper generally has felt that the teaching's really good. It's been really worthwhile. Um, and as a church, as a leadership team, as elders, we want as many of you to be able to access that teaching as possible. And so it's going to be moving to a Wednesday night. Um, we're going to trial Wednesday nights to see if they work. Otherwise, we'll trial Thursday nights next term. Um, but uh, that's the plan for that. So we are, that means that where we've been having a break week for discipleship groups... Um, we're going to be not having a break week for discipleship groups anymore. We have a break week for going deeper. <laughs> Encourage as many people as possible to come along. Um, <clears throat> so discipleship groups are losing their break weeks, um, but you can use the third Sunday of the month instead because that's where going deeper was. So we're not actually taking a day away from you. We're just providing an alternative opportunity. Um, people are already not meeting on discipleship weeks to do their discipleship at other times. Um, and so it was really helpful for us to establish those groups, but now um, they're going to be, 
they're going to carry on running on a more ad hoc basis with the groups organising themselves. I'll still be sending out details every month. So this is, the talk, this is what's coming up. Um, if you're not in a discipleship group, talk to Nina. <laughs> I'm just throwing everything at Nina this morning. Um, discipleship groups are not life groups. They're much more, they're smaller and more intimate. Groups of two to four people where we meet monthly for close discipleship and uh, friendship. And they're a great blessing to many of us across the church. You know, the friendship of uh, the, the three of us in my discipleship group has got much closer in the past year because we've been devoting that time to our walks with Jesus and our walks with one another, seeking to be better disciples of Christ. Um, so let me encourage you to get in one of those. Um, okay. I just wanted to bring um, a bit of an encouragement as well, uh, as something just to think about our Sunday mornings. So we've spoken about life groups, spoken about going deeper and about discipleship groups. But Sunday morning, mornings like this morning, where the people of God has, have gathered and they're lifting their voices together and we're hearing people praying out and extolling the Lord. We're hearing um, the seeking of gifts to be exercised. Um, it's a really precious thing, isn't it? You think about all those believers around the world who can't gather like we can gather. Um, <clears throat> and I just want to encourage each of us to really prioritize our Sunday mornings, to come along, to get involved, get engaged as much as we're able to. And obviously, there are reasons that some of us can't, and that's completely understandable. But for many of us, I think we make more reasons than there are not to get engaged, not to be part of the body on a Sunday morning, um, or not to make it sort of the as much a priority on a Sunday morning as perhaps we'd like it to be. Um, so sort of turning up, when we turn up to church, it's really helpful if we all get here at sort of a bit before 10 o'clock so we can actually have some fellowship and some chat and engage with one another and then come into the main meeting ready to go. Um, for some people, it can be a real distraction uh, with people coming and going. Um, for others, it doesn't matter. But for as much as possible, we want to edify the church, we want to build the church up, and we want to help people to worship. Um, so if we can, let's come in on time. Um, another thing we're changing is we're, going to be, we're not going to be re-establishing the live stream. Um, we're leaving the live stream off. As Julian encouraged this morning, um, you know, perhaps it changes the way we dance. Um, perhaps it changes your willingness to come and bring a word or a scripture or a prophecy. Um, but we're not going to be bringing the live stream back for the time being. Um, and there is a priority. <laughs> There is a good thing to that as well, because it is better. Whatever we do online, it is better to be here, yeah? yeah? Together as the people of God, rather than sitting at home, pausing it to go and get a cup of tea, coming back again. It's, it, this is a special place. Amen. When we gather together, God meets with us in a special way, Amen. yeah? And, and we encourage one another. We build the church up. We proclaim Jesus together. It's really hard to proclaim Jesus in your living room, on your own. You know, it's different here. You know, you take, it's a classic Christian saying, you take a coal from the fire and it will burn out. If you keep it nestled in the fire and it glows, it stays hot, it shines, right? You can see a difference. Stay in the gathered people. Let's make this a priority this new season. And finally, um, life groups this, this season, we're going, to be preach, we're going to be talking about and looking at grace. Um, you know, life groups are a great place to have fellowship with other believers. Um, it's a great place to discover the scriptures, to get in and find out what God says to you, what God's word says. Um, and it's always better to find, find out what the Bible says ourselves rather than have it handed to us on a platter. If we just have it handed to us on a platter week in, week out, our, our understanding is like the, 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 the loose dirt bit on top of the soil. When we dig into the word, you know, we're here, we're built on wild and clay up here, right? when you get into the word, it's like you get down deep and it's claggy and it sticks to your fingers. It, you take it part of you. All right? and so it's really important to be um, getting into life groups, getting into the word together. Um, and this term we're going to be looking at the grace of God. And this is something that is so important for us to get a, gr get a grip of and understand and enjoy and that's what I'm going to preach on this morning. We're going to talk this morning about the grace of God because it is a wondrous thing. So let me pray and then we'll dive in together. Lord Jesus, I thank you 
for, your, for, the, for the grace of God towards us. I thank you, Lord, for all that you reveal to us through Scripture about God's love for us, about how it doesn't come down to us and our works, but it's all about you and what you have done. That we get the free gift of grace to us. So help us, Lord, this morning to uncover the richness of your grace so that we're ready to go into the next season in our life groups of digging into the grace of God and enjoying it more thoroughly. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I'm going to forewarn you, there are going to be some challenges this morning, um, but we never issue a challenge without an opportunity to respond. So sometimes responding is a challenge, but we're going to invite people to come down the front or to turn to their neighbours, and we're going to pray for one another this morning. Um, And now there's no camera, you don't have to worry about coming down to the front and being on YouTube forever, Uh, which is a great blessing. The grace of God is a wondrous thing. Who enjoys the grace of God? There's some very solid arms down <laughs> this morning. <laughs> well, hopefully you're going to enjoy the grace of God some more uh, after today. But, so, uh, so you've said you enjoy it. Who enjoys the grace of God to the full? Ooh. I'm glad no hands went up that time. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to get down and you can come and talk to us <laughs> about the grace of God. What's so good about the grace of God? Someone give me some, what do you love about the grace of God? Yeah, okay. It's a gift. The grace of God is a gift. Amen. He gives us what we don't deserve. Yeah, I'll come to the acronym in a minute. Yeah. Forgiveness. Surprises us. Oh, that's a good one. What do you love about the grace of God? People at the back. It's lavish. Amazing. Extravagant grace. His grace is enough. More than enough. Amen. Yeah, he's the spirit of grace. Amazing. It is free. It doesn't cost us anything. Amen. Now, if you've never, it, never fully considered the grace of God before, it's often described as an acronym. Many of us will know this. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. All right? So it's all of the riches of God's paid for by Christ and given to us as a free gift. Isn't that amazing? So, can you fathom the richness of God? We can't, can we? He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And he, take, he has all of that. And he, his riches are given to us. The riches of his son given for our salvation. It's at the expense of Christ. Okay? So we said grace is free. Grace is free to us. But grace cost a great deal. Grace is one of the solas of the, the Reformation. There are these sort of five solas of the Reformation um, that have been put together, uh, which was when um, people like Martin Luther um, stood against the teaching of the church of his, of his day. Because they were saying, you know, you've got to do this and you've got to do that. And if you want to get your loved one out of purgatory sooner, if you give us a load of money as an indulgence, we will ensure that they get through purgatory quicker. Okay? And the people like Martin Luther saw these things happening and went, no, that's not right. That's wrong. Um, because it was a sort of, there was a, a thing of merit. Okay? It's what you did. If you did the right things, then you'd be saved, okay? If you attended Mass enough, if you came to Mass on a Sunday, and if you could do it, come on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday as well, you come to Mass and you see the, 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 the bread and the wine, and it's sort of in, in, in the view of the church there then, and some churches now, it was the body of Christ being sort of re-sacrificed afresh. And if you did that every week, then you were going to be saved. But if you don't do it, if you don't come to the church, well, you, you're going to lose your salvation. You haven't, you haven't got salvation anymore. It's a really dangerous teaching. Um, and at the Reformation, they, they went back to the scriptures and they worked out that um, we are saved by God's grace alone. It's not grace plus anything else. 
We are saved by grace. It is the gift of a benevolent God given to us. We have no merit to bring to the table, none of our works to bring to the table to present as evidence in our case of salvation. You imagine that day when the day comes and we stand before the judge and if we think we can bring what we've got and go, look, I did this and I did that and I was at church every week. I never missed one service and I was serving all the time and, and God's there but, I, but did you know me? Because that's what it's like. If we think we can bring stuff to the table and go, Lord, look what I've done and get salvation, we've missed the mark because it doesn't, it doesn't, it isn't enough. We are justified. We stand before the judge, justified because of God's grace, not because of our merit, our external works, the things we do. We don't stand before God um, justified because of those things. They are nothing but dirty rags before a majestic and holy God. We can't earn our salvation. We can't do our way into salvation. We can't earn rightness with God. We can only receive salvation as a grace gift from a benevolent father who sent his son himself to give us salvation as a gift of grace. Salvation is the plan of the Father, outworked by the Son, enabled by the Holy Spirit, and it's all accessed by faith in Christ the Son. It's by faith alone. It's one of the other solos of the Reformation. By faith alone, by grace alone. Ephesians 2.8 says this, uh, for it is by grace you have been saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Which is amazing, isn't it? We think, we so often think in our sort of carnal minds, I can do this, I can get this done. Reality is, it is a gift of God. By grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so no one can boast. We are, for we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Okay, see, the grace comes first, and he enables us, by his grace, to do good works. We get salvation first, we are saved, we are secure, and then he frees us, enables us to do amazing things for him live our lives as a result of what he's done, um, which is just phenomenal. Jonathan Edwards um, said this, uh, he was one of the Puritans, he said, you contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. <laughs> oh, we can struggle with that, but that is true. We bring nothing to the table, he gives us everything. That's the grace of God. Through placing our faith in Jesus, the Son of God, we are saved by grace. It is nothing of our own doing. It is the work of God alone. So, we've answered the question this morning, what is grace? What, what's it like? Um, and I've come up with these, these things, which you'll hear, uh, well, they've already said some of them. Grace is generous. Right? It's lavish. It's so much more than we deserve and so much more than we expect. Grace is freely given. As we place our faith in Jesus, we are given grace. We don't earn it. We don't work for it. It's given to us. It's freely given. Grace is costly, not cheap. As I said earlier, Jesus gave his life so that we might experience the grace of God. It cost a great deal. Um, so it's not something we should just consider like cheap grace. You know the classic thing we think about, it's fine, I'm covered by grace. I'm going to go and, I don't know, meet someone on a Friday night and go to the pub and then bring them home. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, but I'm covered by grace, it's fine. What's it matter? Grace covers me, I'm forgiven, I'm justified, it's amazing. Let's not be, that's cheap grace. Right? That's grace that we just discard. Um, it costs a lot. Grace is something not to be abused, but it's something to be thoroughly enjoyed. We should thoroughly enjoy the grace of God. Um, it's there to be 
um, you know, God's grace to us. We shouldn't uh, place limits on it and so on. We should enjoy it to the full, as much as Scripture permits us. Okay, Galatians 5 then. Let's look at the problem there. But first off, let's go with Galatians 5.1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. This is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. We sometimes can think, Jesus set us free so that we can do loads of stuff for him. The reality is, Jesus set us free so that we might be free and not under a yoke, not under a burden, not slaves to the world, slaves to the law. Now, why does Paul have to say to the church at Galatia, it's about freedom? Why does Paul have to say that to the church at Galatia? Well, we find it as we go through the passage and as we look through the rest of the letter. Um, but Paul's basically saying that he's, he's addressing this problem, saying that you think you need to um, submit yourself to the law again. Okay, because they're thinking, they've had these people come around called Judaizers, and they were saying, oh, if, you, if you're actually going to be a believer, then you also need to follow the law of Moses. You do all the stuff that comes from there. And Paul goes through, there's a lot of talk about circumcision in the book of Galatians. Uh, we preached it as a series a few years ago, and I did get a few complaints saying, Craig, you talk about circumcision too much. Uh, <laughs> which was fair play. Um, I can't help what the book says, though. Um, but these people were like, we've received, we, 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 know, we know about Jesus. We know all about him. We've heard about him. We've had the gospel preached. But now we feel like we've also, to ensure our salvation, we've also got to do X, Y, and Z. And Paul's saying, no, it was for freedom that Jesus set us free. Not so that you're going to be tied up again under a yoke, under a burden, trying to follow the law. He set you free so that you might be free from the law and not have to follow it any longer. They were ready to or already accepting the mark of um, Abraham's covenant upon their bodies. They were taking the mark of circumcision to say, yep, we are going to be under the law. They were, they were been told about the grace of God, but they were trying to add to the grace of God by trying to fulfill the law. You know, and, and as you go through, you sort of look at verse 7 to 9, you know, they got the gospel confused. They, they thought that they could save themselves they hadn't grasped the gospel of grace fully. You know, Paul tells them that to even add in a smidge of law, tiniest bit of yeast into the dough changes it. To, to put a smidge of law into the gospel of grace is to completely misunderstand it. So much so that it's, he, he seems to say, like, even question, questioning your salvation, you, you won't receive the kingdom. Um, as it goes on to say later on. You know, he says, you are severed from Christ. You would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. We don't want to be those people, do we? We don't want to fall away from the fullness of the grace of God because we feel like we want to add this in and add that in. It's like, oh, you're only a proper Christian if. You're only saved if. It's clear, do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Let us not take on yokes of burden into our lives um, so that we are heavy, but heavy laden. I've just started reading, um, I've, been, I've been advised by my dear wife that I've chosen a book that's too advanced for our eldest. Um, I've just started reading um, Pilgrim's Progress with my eldest son. And it's a junior one. So, you know, I'm not trying to get him to understand the old English, um, which I love. I, I've read the whole of Pilgrim's Progress out loud in the old English because I just love the sound of the book, of the work. Um, and uh, I was going to say about that. Sorry, I've just lost myself. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. So in, in um, the junior Pilgrim's Progress... Christian is this young guy, and he's going from the city of destruction. He's heading up to the celestial city. Okay, it's a very old book, one of the earliest books ever printed. The original was, and he keeps going place to place. He goes, "I've got this burden." 
I've got this burden. And I, if I go to the celestial city, if I go to the king, he'll, he'll deal with it. Um, and he j- it just keeps getting him down. And I think what we have to realize is so often we'll go through this life and we feel burdened. We've got a weight on our back. Has anyone done a walk with a really heavy rucksack? I have, and you all know, I'm sure, as I've spoken about many times. A heavy rucksack, it just weighs you down, and your legs get tired, and your arms are tired, and you're you're just trudging on. And I think, I wonder how many things in our lives do we take on as burdens and just trudge step after step? You see, Jesus didn't come that we might walk around weary and heavy burdened. He says, take my yoke. My yoke is easy. And this is what the gospel of grace enables for us. We aren't called to trudge with these burdens on our shoulders. We're called to bring our burdens, bring our anxieties, and bring everything, and lay them at the foot of the cross, and even with Jesus, for him to deal with, so that we might be free. Do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. I wonder if you can think about what yokes, what burdens you've taken on this past year, or maybe it's been the past 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, these, these weights of burden that you've, have, you've had put on you, or these weights of burden that you've gone and you've picked up, or have steadily, like Carla's wall, have steadily crept up rather than being knocked down. Now, as I said, this is a new season. This is a fresh start, an opportunity anyway. What yoke have you taken on? What have you given authority in your life? Or what's taken authority in your life? Have you ever felt like, I can't be saved because I've got this so wrong? Or you're questioning whether you're saved because I keep getting this wrong? Have you taken on the yoke, the burden of, I'm just not good enough? God doesn't want to accept me. I'm not good enough. I don't look like those other Christians. It's a lie of the enemy, FYI. Have we sought to add work to the work needed for our salvation? Because the work needed for our salvation isn't ours, it's Jesus's. He's done the work, it's given to us as a gift of grace. I wonder what masters do we put on ourselves? What masters have others put on us? You know, in the church in Galatia, the issue is they're picking up the law again. They're going back to the law, going back to the Mosaic Covenant, saying what the law says. We've got to fulfill all of this. We've got Jesus, great, but we also need to do all of this stuff. You know, they were trying to fulfill the law. They thought, well, if I take this mark, then I'm doing it properly, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm more like following Jesus. Um, they were trying to follow the, fulfill the law, and it was distracting them from the sufficiency of the gospel of grace, of the grace of God. You know, it's important to remember, Jesus came to fulfill the law so that we could keep fulfilling. Oh, that's not true, is it? He came to fulfill the law so we don't have to fulfill the law, so we would be free from it. We are saved by grace, not by works. We partake in good works. Yeah, we do, and we should. We, we should be looking for ways to edify the church family. Can I bring a word on a Sunday morning? Can I help in the kids' work? Can I help to tell them about the gospel of grace? Can I, ser- can I serve, on a, uh, serve on welcome or teas and coffees or on the PA? Or have I got a gift that I could use in worship? Absolutely, do some good stuff. Once you're saved and you are secure in the grace of God, knowing that he died for you and everything else you do is an act of worship not an act of requirement so are you trying to do works to get your salvation have you misunderstood the gospel of grace are you trying to add law to it um, what other masters do we put upon ourselves or have put upon ourselves what about sin about the impact of sin in your life? Is there something ongoing that you just know, you know it's, not, it's not what God wants for me, it's not what his word says is good and pure, um, 
but it's just there and it's actually a bit of a master for you. It's, it's, you just keep doing the same thing over and over again. You keep snapping at people or, or <clears throat> you know, like, and I mean like time and time again. Is there like a, um, a regular sin pattern? I think that just keeps happening that you need to bring to God and say, Lord, I, I, I want to uh, ask your forgiveness for this so that I can walk with you and not be ma- under the master uh, of sin, but instead be under the master of God. You know, Romans 6 tells us that the power of sin is defeated, right? Which means that as much as we feel like these sin issues that we all, we all face, different ones, we feel like they're in charge and they're masters of us. The reality is God's broken the power of sin and our new master is Christ, and we can follow him. He equips us by the Holy Spirit to be able to follow him day by day. <clears throat> Maybe there's a sin issue that for you is a burden on your shoulders that's making it harder for you to, um, to worship. Um, I'm really sorry. Andy, could you pull the curtain there just across? <laughs> is there, someone's windscreen is blinding me. Thank you. Um, okay, so... Uh, what yokes we taken on? The law, perhaps. Maybe there's a sin issue that is a yoke to us, a burden to us that's weighing us down. What about culture? What other burdens are we taking on? Culture. You know, you look at the, the news at the moment. You look at what's being said. Um, you know, you know it's actually, what we thought was right all along is no longer right. This is how you need to think. This is what you've got to do now. And we walk around trying to carefully negotiate, navigate these things. And it becomes a burden to us. It weighs us down. Do we want to let culture dictate our thoughts? Or do we want to let the gospel of grace help us to understand the world we're in? And help us to go, you know what, I'm going to remain in the freedom that Christ wanted me to walk in. I'm not going to take on these burdens. I'm going to stand firm in the gospel. Um, I'm not going to take this on as a yoke to which I have to be led around by. Because that's what a yoke does, isn't it? You know, it pairs up and it enables them to, be, uh, to, do, to go in the same direction. We don't want to go in the same direction that culture's taking us. We want to go in the direction that Christ is taking us, don't we? Yeah, we want to go his way. You know... When we come to pray, we're going to pray through, you know, whether if, there's, if, if you've taken on law in your life as a burden to you. If you've taken on, if there's a sin issue in your life, that's a burden to you. If there's a culture thing in your life or a physical idol, which I'll come on to in a minute, we're going to pray, pray for each other shortly that we might be free of these things. Um, <clears throat> so maybe when we come to prayer, we come to ask for prayer, we want to bring those lies that culture has given us um, bring them to, to Jesus and say, actually, I'm going to go with God's word. I want to, I want to be following God's word. I want to go God's way with the, rather than to the left or the right following the way culture wants me to go. And finally, the other burden or yoke I thought of was physical idols. Perhaps we've got addictions we're struggling with. Always turning to our phones because they give us a hit. You know, that's a real issue for me. Ask anyone at home. You try and have a chat with me. It's like, Craig... Craig, so, what? Huh? Oh, yes. What? Because I'm I'm locked in here. Yeah, this this is a this is an addiction. It's an idol. It's a problem. Um, that I need to work on. No one needs to help me with. Um, but it is a problem, isn't it? How many of us can do 50, more than 15 minutes of work without glancing at our phone if we're sitting behind a computer or sitting reading a book? It's almost impossible now. All right, Neil, we know. (laughs) It's always one. Um, But but for some of us, it's a real issue, okay? Or maybe maybe there are other physical things that are are an issue for us, a a physical idol. Or maybe maybe we're always having to disappear out for a smoke, okay? Now, I'm not going to have a debate over whether smoking is a sin or not. But what I am going to say is, if it is distracting you from the worship and the glory of God then it's a problem. Now, I don't think, I don't think my, look, looking at my phone isn't a sin. I, I need my, in this world that we live in now, I need my phone. I need to be able to phone people. I need to be contactable. You know, send messages and check emails while I'm on the go because I'm often out and about seeing people. Um, 
and uh, I, I need this. So this isn't sinful, but perhaps for some of us, this is a problem, and we need to redress the relationship with this. You know, I love, um, I went to visit Ben Martin down at Dorchester a little while ago, and uh, the week before, he'd said about um, re- bringing a real Bible to church, all right? Because the nice thing about a real Bible is when you sit down, you open it up, and there it is, and you, you're there, and you're in it. You're using your Bible on your phone, one little up and swipe this way, and oh, there's Facebook, Instagram. Oh, so-and-so's message, I wonder what's going on there. All right, it's a distraction, and I think it's good for us to be, bring, bring a paper Bible, be in the Word together. It's a good thing. Now, the medicine to all of these slave masters, there is one medicine. It's to recognize that true freedom, these things offer us freedom. True freedom comes from following Jesus. All right, that's where we get our freedom from. We follow him. We're a disciple. That's what a disciple, a disciple is. It's someone who follows someone else. We're a disciple of Jesus, so we follow him. Because Jesus came to liberate us. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. That's who we stand against. That's who wants to tempt us into doing various things, you know, getting caught up in our phone other than the glory of God. Or caught up in sin rather than the glory of God. That's what the thief does. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy because when we get, he catches us like that, he wants to destroy us. Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly, or have it to the full. That's one of my favorite translations says. We have an enemy who loves to tie us up in knots to stop us being effective witnesses for Christ. And by our freedom through grace, uh, he wants to stop us living out in freedom that we get through grace to witnessing to others about the goodness of God. That's what he wants to stop us doing. When we go Jesus' way, we have freedom given to us by grace. And as we enjoy that grace, we both verbally witness and in a way we live our lives witness about the goodness of God as we enjoy the grace of God. So what does Paul say in Galatians about how we counter this issue? I will, I will wrap this up. Paul says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. You see, what happens if we walk in step with the Spirit, those things are an issue for us. We see them for what they are. So that's what the enemy wants us to walk in. Paul goes on to say, I warn you as I warned warned you before that those who do such things will not enjoy, inherit, sorry, the kingdom of God. You know, the enemy wants us to walk in his ways, the ways of the flesh. We're told, though, in James 4, verse 7, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he he will flee from you. How do we resist the devil? We walk in the Spirit. God, the Holy Spirit, leads us to walk in the ways of God and produce fruit that is in keeping with God's nourishment. So Paul goes on to say this in in, um, in Galatians. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Hands up if you've crucified the flesh. Why are there so few hands down? What does this say? Those who belong to Christ. Hands up if you're a Christian here today, if you belong to Christ. Right. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. What does that mean about you if you're a believer here today? The flesh has been crucified. It has, you have, you, it's been nailed to the tree. Okay? 
So it isn't about, you can sit there all you like and go, I, but I don't, I don't feel like this. I don't feel like I've, I, that the flesh has, has been crucified. But our job isn't to rely on what we feel. Our job is to rely on the word of God. And the word of God says that if you are in him, if you are a believer in Christ Jesus, the flesh has been crucified. All right? Let's live in the good of the words. Let's not live in uh, our sense of feelings or our sense of failure. Let's live in the good of the word. Now, there is a warning, as we heard, about the works of the flesh. I just want to say this before I wrap up. Now, we can walk, as I understand it, the grace of God is such that if I walk in any of those things that I mentioned before about the works of the flesh, the grace of God is such that if I walk in those things, God's grace is sufficient. But what we won't see is the goodness of the kingdom of God in our day all the time we choose to walk in those things. We won't inherit the kingdom of God in this life. The goodness of grace is such that even when we sin, it is covered by God's mercy given to us as a grace gift, but we won't experience the fullness of abundant life, John 10, 10 life, now. If we wonder why life isn't as good as we might hope it is, it could be, and that struggle isn't being caused through persecution for the faith, then perhaps there are ways that we're living under the yoke of sin. Because kingdom life looks like the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is something that we, we can't work on as character attributes. You can't work on fruit. Okay? If you start working on fruit, it will change shape, it will get squished and moldy and go horrible. But you, you can't make it grow. But you can tend it and you can nurture it once it's growing. We too often think, I need to work on being good. You need to really work hard on being good. Um, and we find it a real battle. Instead, let's look for the areas of our lives that are producing the fruit of the Spirit and seek to dwell there. You know, maybe coming to church, maybe being here, being amongst the people of God where the grace of God is being enjoyed. That will um, edify us and we'll see the fruits of the Spirit grow. Church as a place of grace should exude fruits of the Spirit. Right? When we come to church, we should expect to see love. We should expect to see joy peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's, that's what we should be seeing in church life as people walk by the Spirit. <clears throat> if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Now, the enemy wants us to believe that the issues we face in our lives mean that we haven't changed. That's his lie to us. Uh, are you really a Christian? He wants us to believe that our faith in Jesus is cursory and no change has taken place. But the reality is when we place our faith in Jesus, we are changed. We are a new creation. We are in him. And he is in us. Your task, my task, is to live our lives in Christ to the full, seeking to discover more fully day by day the grace of God at work in our lives and to enjoy it to the full. That's what we're here for. So let's do that together. You know, we want BFC as a church that is characterized by the grace of God. When we walk in the spirit rather than the flesh, we more readily experience the grace of God, which means we're less divided in ourselves and in our church as well. If we all seek to walk by the spirit, we'll find that unity grows. We want to be a church of freedom. We want to be a church, a people who experience the kingdom today rather than be those who are suffering under a spirit of legal, legalism, condemnation, or idolatry. We want to be people who walk in freedom. So, I apologize for going over slightly, but there is still time to pray. There's always time to pray, even if the kids come back in. And I'm happy for the kids to come in while we're praying. It's up to you. Yeah, yeah. so if you need to collect your children, you may now go and collect your children. Um, but I want to pray. If you are feeling like you're afflicted by the law, I want to pray for you for freedom this morning um, and fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. If, you are, if there's a sin issue in your life that you feel like you just can't escape, 
then come and get prayer. And we'd love to pray for you for freedom from the power of sin, speak the word into your life, and for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit afresh. If you're feeling the pressure of culture, if you're feeling like everything the world's saying is too much to bear, and you kind of feel like I need to compromise on this and go that way, come, let's pray for you. God's word is faithful and true. So we want to pray for you, and we want to pray for fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. And finally, if you, want, if you are enjoying the grace of God, and you want to be a more effective witness, come and get prayer to, in, to uh, be filled with the Holy Spirit afresh, be empowered for all that God's got for you. Um, but while we're all sitting and thinking about whether or not we want to respond, um, let me pray. Lord Jesus, um, can the band come up now? Sorry. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for your great love for us. Uh, while we were still sinners, you came and you died for us. We want to thank you for your grace. And my prayer for us as a church, Lord, is that we would more fully enjoy and encounter the grace of God. That we might not be put under heavy burdens, under yokes that lead us in different directions, but instead would enjoy the freedom of following the Lord Jesus. We pray, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, you'd help us to do that. In his name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.